Part three A Voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lugnug, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. Chapter one The author sets out on his third voyage, is taken by pirates, the malice of a Dutchman, his arrival at an island. He is received into Laputa. I had not been at home above ten days, when Captain William Robinson, a Cornish man, commander of the Hopewell, a stout ship of three hundred tons, came to my house. I had formerly been surgeon of another ship where he was master, and a fourth part owner, in voyage to the Levant. He had always treated me like a brother than an inferior officer, and, hearing of my arrival, made me a visit, as I apprehended only out of friendship, for nothing passed more than what is usual after long absences. But, repeating his visits often, expressing his joy to find me in good health, asking whether I were now settled for life, adding that he intended a voyage to the East Indies in two months. At last he plainly invited me, though with some apologies to be surgeon of the ship, that I should have another surgeon under me, besides our two mates, that my salary should be double to the usual pay, and that having experienced my knowledge in sea affairs to be at least equal to his, he would enter into any engagement to follow my advice, as much as if I had shared in the command. He said so many other obliging things, and I knew him to be so honest a man, that I could not reject this proposal. The thirst I had of seeing the world, notwithstanding my past misfortunes, continuing as violent as ever. The only difficulty that remained was to persuade my wife, whose consent, however, I at last obtained, by the prospect of advantage she proposed to her children. We set out the fifth day of August, 1706, and arrived at Fort St. George, the 11th of April, 1707. We stayed there three weeks to refresh our crew, many of whom were sick. From thence we went to Tonquin, where the captain resolved to continue some time, because many of the goods he intended to buy were not ready, nor could he expect to be dispatched in several months. Therefore, in hopes to defray some of the charges he must be at, he brought a sloop, loaded it with several sorts of goods, where would the Tonquinese usually trade to the neighbouring islands, and putting fourteen men on board, whereof three were of the country, he appointed me master of the sloop, and gave me power to traffic while he transacted his affairs at Tonquin. We had not sailed above three days, when a great storm arising, we were driven five days to the north-north-east, and then to the east, after which we had fair weather, but still with a pretty strong gale from the west. Upon the tenth day we were chased by two pirates, who soon overtook us, for my sloop was so deep laden that she sailed very slow. Neither were we in a condition to defend ourselves. We were boarded about the same time by both the pirates, who entered furiously at the head of their men. But finding us all prostrate upon our faces, for so I gave order, they poignoned us with strong ropes, and setting guard upon us, went to search the sloop. I observed among them a Dutchman, who seemed to be of some authority, though he was not commander of either ship. He knew us by our countenance to be Englishmen, and jabbering to us in his own language, swore we should be tied back to back and thrown into the sea. I spoke in Dutch tolerably well. I told him who we were, and begged him, in consideration of our being Christians and Protestants, of neighbouring countries in strict alliance, that he would move the captains to take some pity on us. This inflamed his rage. He repeated his threatenings, and turning to his companions, spoke with great vehemence in the Japanese language, as I suppose, often using the word Christianos. The largest of the two pirate ships was commanded by a Japanese captain, who spoke a little Dutch, 
but very imperfectly. He came up to me, and after several questions, which I answered in great humility, he said, We should not die. I made the captain a very low bow, and then, turning to the Dutchman, said, I was sorry to find more mercy in a heathen than in a brother Christian. But I had soon reason to repent those foolish words, for that malicious reprobate, having often endeavoured, in vain, to persuade both the captains that I might be thrown into the sea, which they would not yield to after they promised they made me that I should not die, however, prevailed so far as to have a punishment inflicted on me worse in all human appearance than death itself. My men were sent by equal division into both the pirate ships, and my sloop new manned. As to myself, it was determined that I should be set adrift in a small canoe, with paddles and a sail, and four days' provisions, which last the Japanese captain was so kind to double out of his own stores, and would permit no man to search me. I got down into the canoe, while the Dutchman, standing upon the deck, loaded me with all the curses and injurious terms his language could afford. About an hour before we saw the pirates, I had taken an observation, and found we were in the latitude of 46 north, and longitude of 183. When I was at some distance from the pirates, I discovered, by my pocket-glass, several islands to the south-east. I set up my sail, the wind being fair, with a design to reach the nearest of those islands, which I made a shift to do in about three hours. It was all rocky. However, I got many birds' eggs, and, striking fire, I kindled some heath and dry seaweed, by which I roasted my eggs. I ate no other supper, being resolved to spare my provisions as much as I could. I passed the night under the shelter of a rock, strewing some heath under me, and slept pretty well. The next day I sailed to another island, and thence to a third and fourth, sometimes using my sail, and sometimes my paddles. But, not to trouble the reader with a particular account of my distresses, let it suffice that on the fifth day I arrived at the last island in my sight, which lay south-south-east to the former. This island was at a greater distance than I expected, and I did not reach it in less than five hours. I encompassed it almost round, before I could find a convenient place to land in, which was a small creek, about three times the wideness of my canoe. I found the island to be all rocky, only a little intermingled with tufts of grass and sweet-smelling herbs. I took out my small provisions, and after having refreshed myself, I secured the remainder in a cave, whereof there were great numbers. I gathered plenty of eggs upon the rocks, and got a quantity of dry seaweed and parched grass, which I designed to kindle the next day, and roast my eggs as well as I could, for I had about me my flint, steel, match, and burning-glass. I lay all night in the cave where I had lodged my provisions. My bed was the same dry grass and seaweed, which I intended for fuel. I slept very little, for the disquiets of my mind prevailed over my weariness, and kept me awake. I considered how impossible it was to preserve my life in so desolate a place, and how miserable my end must be. Yet found myself so listless and desponding, that I had not the heart to rise. And before I could get spirits enough to creep out of my cave, the day was far advanced. I walked a while among the rocks. The sky was perfectly clear, and the sun so hot that I was forced to turn my face from it. When, all on a sudden, it became obscure, as I thought, in a manner very different from what happens by the interposition of a cloud. I turned back, and perceived a vast, opaque body between me and the sun moving forwards towards the island. 
it seemed to be about two miles high, and hid the sun six or seven minutes. But I did not observe the air to be much colder, or the sky more darkened, than if I had stood under the shade of a mountain. As it approached nearer over the place where I was, it appeared to be a firm substance, the bottom flat, smooth, and shining very bright, from the reflection of the sea below. I stood upon a height about two hundred yards from the shore, and saw this vast body descending almost to be parallel with me, at less than an English mile distance. I took out my pocket perspective, and could plainly discover numbers of people moving up and down the sides of it, which appeared to be sloping. But what those people were doing I was not able to distinguish. The natural love of life gave me some inward motion of joy, and I was ready to entertain a hope that this adventure might, some way or other, help to deliver me from the desolate place and condition I was in. But at the same time the reader can hardly conceive my astonishment to behold an island in the air, inhabited by men, who were able, as it should seem, to raise or sink, or put it into progressive motion, as they pleased. But, not being at that time in a disposition to philosophize upon this phenomenon, I rather chose to observe what course the island would take, because it seemed for a while to stand still. Yet, soon after, it advanced nearer, and I could see the sides of it encompassed with several gradations of galleries and stairs at certain intervals, to descend from one to the other. In the lowest gallery, I beheld some people fishing with long, angling rods, and others looking on. I waved my cap, for my hat was long since worn out, and my handkerchief towards the island, and upon its nearer approach I called and shouted with the utmost strength of my voice. And then, looking circumspectly, I beheld a crowd gather to that side which was most in my view. I found, by their pointing towards me and to each other, that they plainly discovered me, although they made no return to my shouting. But I could see four or five men running in great haste, up the stairs to the top of the island, who then disappeared. I happened rightly to conjecture that these were sent for orders to some person in authority upon this occasion. The number of people increased, and, in less than half an hour, the island was moved and raised in such a manner that the lowest gallery appeared in a parallel of less than a hundred yards distance from the height of where I stood. I then put myself in the most supplicating posture, and spoke in the humblest accent, but received no answer. Those who stood nearest over against me seemed to be persons of distinction, as I supposed by their habit. They conferred earnestly with each other, looking often upon me. At length one of them called out in a clear, polite, smooth dialect, not unlike in sound to the Italian, and therefore I returned an answer in that language, hoping at least that the cadence might be more agreeable to his ears. Although neither of us understood the other, yet my meaning was easily known, for the people saw the distress I was in. They made signs for me to come down from the rock, and go towards the shore, which I accordingly did, and the flying island being raised to a convenient height, the verge directly over me, a chain was let down from the lowest gallery, with a seat fastened to the bottom, to which I fixed myself, and was drawn up by pulleys. Part 3 A Voyage to Laputa, Balnababi, Lugnag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan Chapter 2 The Humours and Dispositions of the Laputians Described An Account of Their Learning Of the King and His Court The Author's Reception There the inhabitants subject to fear and disquietudes, an account of the women. At my alighting I was surrounded with a crowd of people. 
that those who stood nearest seemed to be of better quality. They beheld me with all the marks and circumstances of wonder. Neither, indeed, was I much in their debt, having never till then seen a race of mortals so singular in their shapes, habits, and countenances. Their heads were all reclined, either to the right or the left, one of their eyes turned inward, and the other directly up to the zenith. Their outward garments were adorned with the figures of suns, moons, and stars, interwoven with those of fiddles, flutes, harps, trumpets, guitars, harpsichords, and many other musical instruments, unknown to us in Europe. I observed, here and there, many in the habit of servants, with a brown bladder, fastened like a flail to the end of a stick, which they carried in their hands. In each bladder was a small quantity of dried peas, or little pebbles, as I was afterwards informed. With these bladders, they now and then flapped the mouths and ears of those who stood near them, of which practice I could not then conceive the meaning. It seems the mind of these people are so taken up with the intense speculations that they can neither speak nor attend to the discourses of others without being roused by some external taction upon the organs of speech and hearing, for which reason those persons who are able to afford it always keep a flapper, the original is Klimnol, in their family, as one of their domestics nor ever walk abroad, or make visits without him. And the business of this officer is, when two, three, or more persons are in company, gently to strike with his bladder the mouth of him who is to speak, and the right ear of him, or them, to whom the speaker addresses himself. This flapper is likewise employed diligently to attend his master in his walks, and, upon occasion, to give him a soft flap on his eyes, because he is always so wrapped up in cogitation, that he is in manifest danger of falling down every precipice, and bouncing his head against every post, and in the streets, of jostling others, or being jostled himself into the kennel. It was necessary to give the reader this information, without which he would be at the same loss with me to understand the proceedings of these people. "'as they conducted me up the stairs to the top of the island, "'and from thence to the royal palace. "'While we were ascending, they forgot several times "'what they were about, and left me to myself, "'till their memories were again roused by their flappers, "'for they appeared altogether unmoved by the sight "'of my foreign habit and countenance, "'and by the shouts of the vulgar, "'whose thoughts and minds were more disengaged.' At last we entered the palace, and proceeded into the chamber of presence, where I saw the king seated on his throne, attended on each side by persons of prime quality. Before the throne was a large table filled with globes and spheres, and mathematical instruments of all kinds. His majesty took not the least notice of us, although our entrance was not without sufficient noise by the concourse of all persons belonging to the court. But he was then deep in a problem, and we attended at least an hour before he could solve it. There stood by him, on each side, a young page with flaps in their hands, and when they saw he was at leisure, one of them gently struck his mouth, and the other his right ear. At which he started like one awaked on the sudden, and looking towards me and the company I was in, recollect the occasion of our coming, whereof he had been informed before. He spoke some words, whereupon immediately a young man with a flap came up to my side, and flapped me gently on the right ear. But I made signs, as well as I could, that I had no occasion for such an instrument, which, as I afterwards found, gave his majesty and the whole court a very mean opinion of my understanding. The king, as far as I could conjecture, asked me several questions, and I addressed myself to him in all the languages I had. When it was found I could neither understand nor be understood, I was conducted by his order to an apartment in his palace, 
this prince being distinguished above all his predecessors for his hospitality to strangers where two servants were appointed to attend me my dinner was brought and four persons of quality whom i remember to have seen very near the king's person did me the honour to dine with me we had two courses of three dishes each in the first course there was a shoulder of mutton cut into an equal actual triangle a piece of beef into a rhomboides and a pudding into a cycloid the second course was two ducks trussed up in the form of fiddles sausages and puddings resembling flutes and hoboys and a breast of veal in the shape of a harp the servants cut our bread into cones cylinders parallelograms and several other mathematical figures after dinner my company withdrew and a person was sent to me by the king's order attended by a flapper he brought with him pen ink and paper and three or four books giving me to understand by signs that he was sent to teach me the language we sat together four hours in which time i wrote down a great number of words in columns with the translations over against them i likewise made a shift to learn several short sentences for my tutor would order one of my servants to fetch something to turn about to make a bow to sit or to stand or walk and the like then i took down the sentence in writing he showed me also in one of his books the figures of the sun moon and stars the zodiac the tropics and polar circles together with the denominations of many planes and solids he gave me the names and descriptions of all the musical instruments and the general terms of art in playing on each of them after he had left me i placed all my words with their interpretations in alphabetical order and thus in a few days by the help of a very faithful memory i got some insight into their language the word which i interpret the flying or floating island is in the original Laputa, whereof I could never learn the true entomology. Lap, in the old obsolete language, signifies high, and Unta, a governor, from which they say, by corruption, was derived Laputa, from Lapunta. But I do not approve of this derivation, which seems to be a little strained. I ventured to offer to the learned among them a conjecture of my own, that Laputa was quasi-lapouted, lap, signifying property, the dancing of the sunbeams in the sea, and outed, a wing, which, however, I shall not obtrude, but submit to the judicious reader. Those to whom the king had entrusted me, observing how ill I was clad, ordered a tailor to come next morning and take measure for a suit of clothes. The operator did his office after a different manner from those of his trade in Europe. He first took my altitude by a quadrant, and then, with a rule and a compass, described the dimensions and outlines of my whole body, all which he entered upon paper, and in six days brought me clothes very ill-made and quite out of shape by happening to mistake a figure in the calculation. But my comfort was, that I observed such accidents very frequent, and little regarded. During my confinement for want of clothes, and by an indisposition that held me some days longer, I much enlarged my dictionary, and when I went next to court, was able to understand many things the king spoke, and to return him some kind of answers. His Majesty had given orders that the island should move northeast and by east to a vertical point over Lagado, the metropolis of the whole kingdom below, upon the firm earth. It was about ninety leagues distant, and our voyage lasted four days and a half. I was not in the least sensible of the progressive motion in the air by the island. On the second morning, about eleven o'clock, the king, himself in person, attended by his nobility, courtiers, and officers, 
having prepared all their musical instrument, played on them for three hours, without intermission, so that I was quite stunned with the noise. Neither could I possibly guess the meaning, till my tutor informed me. He said that the people of their island had their ears adapted to hear the music of the spheres, which always played at certain periods, and the court was now prepared to bear their part in whatever instrument they most excelled. In our journey towards Lagado, the capital city, His Majesty ordered that the island should stop over certain towns and villages, from whence he might receive the petitions of his subjects. And to this purpose several pack-threads were let down, with small weights at the bottom. On these pack-threads the people strung their petitions, which mounted up directly, like the scraps of paper fastened by schoolboys at the end of the string that holds their kite. Sometimes we received wines and victuals from below, which were drawn up by pulleys. The knowledge I had in mathematics gave me great assistance in acquiring their phraseology, which depended much upon that science, and music, and in the latter I was not unskilled. Their ideas are perpetually conservant in lines and figures. If they would, for example, praise the beauty of a woman, or any other animal, they described it by rhombus, circles, parallelograms, ellipses, and other geometric terms, or by words of art drawn from music, needless here to repeat. I observed in the king's kitchen all sorts of mathematical and musical instruments, after the figures of which they cut up the joints that were served to his majesty's table. Their houses are very ill-built, the walls bevel, without one right angle in any apartment, and this defect arises from the contempt they bear to practical geometry, which they despise as vulgar and mechanic. Those instructions they give being too refined for the intellects of their workmen, which occasions perpetual mistakes, and although they are dexterous enough upon a piece of paper, in the management of the rule, the pencil and the divider, yet in the common actions and behaviour of life, I have not seen a more clumsy, awkward, and unhandy people, nor so slow and perplexed in their conceptions upon all other subjects, except those of mathematics and music. They are very bad reasoners, and vehemently given to opposition, unless, when they happen to be of the right opinion, which is seldom their case. Imagination, fancy, and invention, they are wholly strangers to, nor have any words in their language, by which these ideas can be expressed, the whole compass of their thoughts and minds being shut up within the two forementioned sciences. Most of them, and especially those who deal in the astronomical part, have great faith in judicial astrology, although they are ashamed to own it publicly. But what I chiefly admire, and thought altogether unaccountable, was the strong disposition I observed in them, towards news and politics, perpetually inquiring into public affairs, giving their judgments in matters of state, and passionately disputing every inch of a party opinion. I have indeed observed the same disposition among most of the mathematicians I have known in Europe, although I could never discover the least analogy between the two sciences, unless those people suppose that because the smallest circle has as many degrees as the largest, therefore the regulation and management of the world require no more abilities than the handling and turning of a globe. But I rather take this quality to spring from a very common infirmity of human nature, inclining us to be most curious and conceited in manners where we have least concern, and from which we are least adapted by study or nature. These people are under continual disquietudes, never enjoying a minute's peace of mind, and their disturbances proceed from causes which very little affect the rest of mortals. Their apprehensions arise from several changes they dread in the celestial bodies. For instance, that the earth, by the continual approaches of the sun towards it, must, in course of time, be absorbed or swallowed up, 
that the face of the sun will, by degrees, be encrusted with its own effluvia, and give no more light to the world. That the earth very narrowly escaped a brush from the tail of the last comet, which would have infallibly reduced it to ashes, and that the next, which they have calculated for one and thirty years hence, will probably destroy us. For if, in its prehelion, it should approach within a certain degree of the sun, as by their calculations they have reason to dread, it will receive a degree of heat ten thousand times more intense than that of a red, hot, glowing iron, and, in its absence from the sun, carry a blazing tail ten hundred thousand and fourteen miles long, through which, if the earth should pass at a distance of one hundred miles from the nucleus, or the main body of the comet, it must, in its passage, be set on fire, and reduced to ashes. That the sun, daily spending its rays without any nutriment to supply them, will at last be wholly consumed and annihilated, which must be attended with the destruction of this earth, and of all the planets that receive their light from it. They are so perpetually alarmed with the apprehensions of these, and the like impending dangers, that they could neither sleep quietly in their beds, nor have any relish for the common pleasures and amusements of life. When they meet an acquaintance in the morning, the first question is about the sun's health, how he looked at his setting and rising, and what hopes they have to avoid the stroke of the approaching comet. This conversation they are apt to run into with the same temper that boys discover in delighting to hear terrible stories of spirits and hobgoblins, which they greedily listen to, and dare not go to bed for fear. The women of the island have abundance of vivacity. They contemn their husbands, and are exceedingly fond of strangers, whereof there is always a considerable number from the continent below, attending at court, either upon affairs of the several towns and corporations, or their own particular occasions, but are much despised, because they want the same endowments. Among these the ladies choose their gallants, but the vexation is that they act with too much ease and security, for the husband is always so wrapped in speculation that the mistress and lover may proceed to the greatest familiarities before his face, if he be but provided with paper and implements, and without his flapper at his side. The wives and daughters lament their confinement to the island, although I think it is the most delicious spot of ground in the world and, although they live here in the greatest plenty and magnificence, and are allowed to do whatever they please, they long to see the world, and take the diversions of the metropolis, which they are not allowed to do without a particular license from the king, and that is not easy to be obtained, because the people of quality have found, by frequent experience, how hard it is to persuade their women to return from below. I was told that a great court lady, who had several children, is married to the Prime Minister, the richest subject in the kingdom, a very graceful person, extremely fond of her, and lives in the finest palace of the island. Went down to Lagado on the pretense of health, there hid herself for several months, till the king sent a warrant to search for her, and she was found in an obscure eating-house all in rags having pawned her clothes to maintain an old, deformed footman, who beat her every day, and in whose company she was taken much against her will. And although her husband received her with all possible kindness, and without the least reproach, she soon after contrived to steal down again, with all her jewels, to the same gallant, and has not been heard of since. This may perhaps pass with the reader, rather for a European or English story, than for one of a country so remote. But he may please to consider that the caprices of womankind are not limited by any climate or nation, and that they are much more uniform than can be easily imagined. In about a month's time, I had made a tolerable proficiency in their language, and was able to answer most of the king's questions, when I had the honour to attend him. 
His Majesty discovered not the least curiosity to inquire into the laws, government, history, religion, or manners of the countries where I had been, but confined his questions to the state of mathematics, and received the account I gave him with great contempt and indifference, though often roused by his flapper on each side.' 